Hello everyone, as Lucy said, my name is Elizabeth Bustamante and I'm very, very excited to talk to you today about manufacturing defects caused by lamp patterns. I currently manage a team of 11 electrical and mechanical engineers and we are creating thousands of cat libraries per week for the 1 million engineers on our platform, snapdea.com. We are basically helping our users to design their symbols and land patterns to ensure proper manufa manufacturing. And some of the defects that I'm going to share today were real situations that our users faced and I will be also sharing how we help them to figure them out. We have one more question. Okay, the question is if we're recording the, the session. Yes, we are. <laughs> Okay, so in this webinar, I'll go through the difference between footprints and land patterns. Then I will take a look at some of the most common manufacturing defects due to poorly designed land patterns. Next, I'm planning to share some library creation tips that will help you to avoid manufacturing defects. And then at the, at the end, we'll just jump into how we can automate CAD models. Uh, we can automate the verification processes for CAD models, is to verify CAD models. And just a quick intro about what is SnapDA and Sierra Circuits. So let's just get started with the basics. Um, the question is, what are footprints versus land patterns in a PCB. And I think this is a really good question because we usually think about these terms as if they were just the same thing, right? But then if you put a component into sand, it will leave an imprint. That imprint will be a footprint just it's just its actual physical size and i found this example in the, in the internet is a really good example so that's why i wanted to share it with everyone and then the difference is between that footprint and the lamp pattern is that when we're talking about lamp patterns we use that term when we want to define the size of the paths and the outline for a given component that should be designed onto a PCB. One thing that it's worth mentioning is that a component can have multiple lamp patterns based on the IPC density level that you will follow. And there are also other parameters. And then, um, you can only have one footprint. You can only have one footprint for a component. But again, you can have multiple land patterns. In this whole presentation, we'll be talking, we'll be referring to footprints as land patterns. And so now let's talk about some of the basic elements of land patterns. So first we have the pin one indicator, also known as the post assembly inspection dot. And it is in the, it is normally placed on the seal screen layer, meaning that is visible after the assembly process. It helps to verify that the component are, was assembled with the correct rotation. And then we have the seal screen, or also known as legend layer. It basically 
serves as a reference indicator for placing components in your PCB. And then we have the documentation layer right here. The documentation layer is where you can basically add all your manufacturing nodes. You can add everything you want to see or remember during the design process because everything that you're drawing this layer will not be present in your final PCB. Then we also have solder mask layer, which indicates um, where the solder mask should not be applied. And then we also have the stencil containing mainly the solder paste data of SMD. It looks like we have one question right now from Michael. Michael said, will the slides be available for download? I think they will. I think they will. So don't worry. <laughs> Great. So then we have the courtyard. When we're talking about courtyard, we need to we need to mention that there are two terms. The first one is the contour courtyard, and the other one is the courtyard excess. The contour courtyard basic it just basically provides the minimum electrical and mechanical clearance around the combined component component body and the lamp pattern and your lamp pattern boundaries. And then the courtyard excess is actually the clearance. The clearance is the area between that rectangle containing the lamp pattern and the, com and the component and the outer boundary of the courtyard. About the manufacturing defects that are uh, caused by lamp patterns. And so before, before starting with, with this one, um, I want to mention that there are a lot more causes, as you might know, for these manufacturing defects to happen. But the causes that I'm going to share in this presentation are mostly related to land patterns, to designing your land patterns. So you will not see, you will not see a lot around designing the PCB itself, but mostly around the land pattern design. The first manufacturing defects is a well-known <laughs> defect called tombstoning. And then what happens is that your, uh, your PCB pads is completely or partially lift, lifted from the, piece, from the PCB board, from the board, right? And so one of the main causes, again, re regarding going back to the lamp patterns, is when your pads are designed, and this happened mostly with SMD2 pad packages, and so it's when the pad designs are have different sizes. Another another cause there is also a common one is when there's not enough solder paste. So what happens is that either having an incorrect lead land or not having enough solder paste is going to basically lift um, that lift when an entire when entering a solder in a solder bath. Okay, it looks like before going to the next slide, we have another question. What drives, so the question is, what drives the boundary of the courier excess? Okay, so let's go back. So what drives the, the, the boundary of the courier excess? So I mentioned before that 
it has, there are different parameters that you need to consider. The main one that I want to mention in this presentation is that it depends on the IPC level, uh, the IPC density level that you're following. So for example, for BGAs, if your density level, I think is level B, the value of the coir excess should be one millimeter. That's based on IPC 7351B. Okay, I hope that answers um, your question. And then, you know, sometimes it also depends on, um, it also depends on the assembly process. And then we have another, another question. Okay, we have a lot of questions. Tom stoning also, so the question, the next question is, Tom stoning also happens due to design issue, correct? I guess, so I guess that means, what I was trying to explain is that yes, it, it can be due to design issues, um, but especially when you're designing your paths for S and D, commonly happening as MD2 path components. Then we have um, another question. How does the lamp pattern determine the amount of solder paste? Is it just that the bigger a pad is, the more solder paste will be used? So the general recommendation is to make large pad sizes not necessarily, and I'm going to answer that question in one of the next slides, which is about designing um, your solder paste stencil. So let's wait until we get to that presentation. Okay, so um, let's, let's keep going. Let's go to the next slide. So we also have the second uh, manufacturing defect that I wanted to share today was solder bridges. So that happens when two solder joints connect and you know that can cause a lot lots of problems. Especially you can burn, you know, you can burn your entire component with something like that just happens. And one of the most common costs is when you are designing, for example, a fine pitch package. In this case, as my example shows, this is a BGA. And then what happens is that you ended up designing your solder mask openings too big. And then let's say that you are not meeting the clearance, the solder mask opening to solder mask opening clearance. And so with the, when that happens, you can have two, those two joints connecting to each other. That usually happens when between pads, adjacent, and adjacent pad, pads. Okay. We have more questions. Brian said, S empty inductors always seem to be a problem since the pads are on the bottom, not the edges. Any suggestion to improve this? So, so Brian, to answer your question, every time our team is going to get started with designing a footprint, it doesn't matter what type, of footprint is at the beginning. First, we evaluate all the different parameters that, you know, that are important for us when we're going to, when we're going to design with that component. So you need to ask yourself some of the questions that I'm going to share later in the presentation and also some recommendations. So in the presentation, I'm gonna share some tips that will help you to identify how you can design 
your components, including S S M SMT inductors. And then you can kind of get a, a better idea around that once we get to the next slide. So. Okay, so let's keep talking about the manufacturing defects. The next one is having small drill holes in the PCB. So you can have either drill holes that are too, too, too small that the components will not fit. Doesn't matter where you try, it's very hard that it will fit. Or you can also have drill holes that are too big. And so in those, in that um, occasion, what happened is that, you know, it can cause a solder to leak or to float out of the hole. And then in this example that I'm sharing in the presentation, you can see that for this type of, um, for this type of connector, what happened was that it looks like when it was designed, it looks like the designer forgot to check the drill hole size of the of this pin that you're seeing here that is being pointed here because that drill size is what it will is what would allow the component to go into the PCB. And so if it was designed you know with a smaller drill then of course the component is going to happen what, what you can see here the component is just not going to fit and no, no point go all the way into the PCB. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So this one is uh, the one that I was talking about just a couple minutes ago. And this is the one that I wanted to share more information regarding the solder, the, the paste mask. So this issue, let's get started with the manufacturing defect. The name is floating, floating components. Basically, it's just when you have an excess of solder paste that can just make your part you know, float and that can lead to unconnected pins. You can pretty much ruin your design by having these comp components floating on top of the of just the excess of solder paste right so the main cause for that is when you don't properly design your solder paste stencil and so the example that i wanted to share here is with uh qf hands because that's uh that's like the typical example and also the most common one and so basically, what IPC recommends in these cases, IPC 7351 says that if the expo spot of your component is a square about four by four millimeters, the paste mask should be segmented into symmetric path array, just like you are seeing on this example on the right side. You can see that there are four small squares here where the solder paste is going to be applied to, right? And so IPC also states, it states that if that square is less, you know, is below four by four millimeters, then you can do, you can apply the 40% rule of the exposed expo pad area. You need to take into account that this, this really depends on the IPC standard that you're gonna follow. IPC 7351B says that you should use for, it should be 40%, the, the, uh, the, 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 the the paste mask should be 40% of the Xbox area, but then you have IPC 7525 
recommended you to use between 50% and 80% of the exposed bath area. So basically it depends on the standard that you're gonna follow and also your entire PCB design process, right? So the other thing that I wanted to mention about this manufacturing defect is that you know designing a proper stencil is cru crucial to ensure successful reflow soldering especially with this type of packages that you're seeing in this presentation like this exposed pad package and also custom PCB footprints and then if you do that then you will have high quality solder joints. It looks like we have one more question. How do you get, the question is, how do you get around this potential problem? Okay, that's, that's a good question. So what I've, uh, from my experience and from what I read, um, sometimes you just have to pretty much, if you reach out the point where you have the PCB with this component that is floating, you can try to unsolder, manually unsolder the component. Maybe you can apply I don't know, like some heat or you can try to remove the component and try to manually solder the component yourself, but it is not 100% you know, accurate. It's not sure that it's gonna, it's gonna work. Okay, <laughs> now let's keep going. So again, just to recap, IPC 7525 is an excellent guideline of industry specification in designing the optimum stencil for your components. So I invite you to take a look at that standard, um, or if not, you can just stick to IPC 7351B standard. And now we have a very sad defect, manufacturing defect, that can be caused by land patterns. Okay, we have two more questions. Repeat the IPC standard, please. The IPC standard for the one that I just mentioned for the sten optimum stencil design is IPC 7525. Mar Marco asked the same question. Good morning, what is the IPC number you mentioned in the previous slide? Yes, so it's IPC 7525 for optimum, uh, optimum stencil design. Okay, so let's, let's keep going with this manufacturing defect. Burn components. Sometimes this issue can be due to incorrect pin number in your, in your footprints. So if your, sorry, land pattern, <laughs> if your land pattern has the incorrect pin numbering, then you're gonna end up making the wrong connections. If you have the wrong connections, you can burn your, your component. And then another common issue is wrong pin mapping. Wrong pin mapping, let's say is you're just taking a look at the pinout table and you can, there can be multiple, multiple issues. There can be multiple things happening. One of them inc including uh, being, you know, the manufacturing not sharing the proper information to do the pin mapping. And I'm gonna share an example about that in the presentation as well. 
We have another question. What is the, okay, it looks like it was answered. Okay. Now we have components that won't fit. Sometimes there are, so there, there can be multiple situations that can take you to having this problem. But the main one that I wanted to share, and it was because I found this issue in a data sheet, is the path to path distance. The other ones are, you know, you can, you just have the wrong, foot, the wrong footprint or the wrong land pattern. But then in this case, the path to path distance is because, as you can see here, these manufacturers, these, these are two different versions of the same data sheet component. You can see that on the left, on the left, the, the image that is on the left, you can see that the manufacturer says the distance between the hole and pad number eight is 8.89. But then if you take a deep look at the data sheet and you say, well, is that even possible? Because if you multiply 1.27 times seven, that's 8.89. And that is, this has to be, you know, it has to be longer. This distance is wrong, right? And so you ended up finding a different data sheet a different version where the manufacturer is like, okay, we made a mistake. The real distance between the real 8.89 distance is to define, you know, distance between the pad one and pad eight, right? So this is just something that I wanted to share because it can happen. There are different, we have been seeing those issues more frequent. Some data sheets, data sheets change, they start changing the information when they have newer versions. And some of, you know, some of the information is really important, just, you know, just that you cannot ignore it. Okay, now, Now we have, okay, we have just one comment and it's thanks. <laughs> okay, now, um, now that we have been going through um, some of the manufacturing defects, I want to start sharing some very, very valuable tips for creating land patterns. These tips are going to help you to choose the proper land sizes. It's going to help you to choose the best component ba based on your needs, based on your circuit application. And so the first, the first tip that I want to share is that you need to ask yourself, what am I going to do? What is my product about? Am I going, am I going to design, you know, am I going to design a, rob, a robust PCB that's gonna have lots of components? And so in those cases, you need to, in those cases, when you start asking yourself those questions, you should pick the most appropriate IP, IPC density level because that will help you to design the paths based on the density level of your PCB. So for example, for low component density, you can have, you can have, um, for low component density, you can have level A and then you can also have, for median, you can have level B, and then the density level C is for high component densities. 
And so what happens, what it really happens between all those levels is just that the footprint geometry, the land pattern geometry changes. So it can be, a, it can have minimum, you know, minimum sizes, the minimum sizes possible, the median sizes or the maximum sizes. The second tip is that, and very important, is that you need to define your courtyard for your land patterns. And the reason why this one is so important is because if you are needing space in your PCB or if you, you know, you're, you're designing a very, very small product, you cannot waste any, you know, any of the, of the space that you have on your PCB, right? So defining the courtyard is highly important, first, because of that. Second, because you can place components, other components, very close to the component that you have a bad courtyard for. And so what can happen at the end is that you can have two components so close that they might not even, you might not even be able to place them on the PCB because they're so close. Okay, so we have some questions. So James asked, will you be covering HDI in this presentation? Um, no, I won't. This is uh, mainly, mainly just um, the defects caused by line patterns. So, but I guess if you have any other questions, I can I can try to help. We also have one more question for SMT hand soldering. It's recommendable to use level A or bigger sizes. From from what I from what I know, when you are going to do hand soldering, yes, the you know the proper the proper level that you should follow should be the level that that will give you the biggest geometry land pattern sizes. So okay, now let's go to the next. The next tip. The next tip is please always make sure that you're running your DRC and ERC checks because you can, for example, you can avoid wrong connections by identifying if your symbol, your schematic symbol, has the proper paint direction, you, your electrical roll checking is going to understand your connection. It's going to pass them or not based on those pin directions and the wires that you have that you use to make th that connection. So that's very important. And then also uh, set up your DRC, especially in this case that I wanted to show for solder mass clearance. Because in this case, you have again an SMD to package. And as you can see, the solder mask opening was this was designed, trying to be designed as a gang, um, as a gang op mask opening, but you can see here in this line that they're actually overlapping, meaning that each pad has its own solder mask opening. And so just make, just make sure that you have that and that you're, you have the DRC checks for this type of issues, for this clearance. So, you know, just to avoid just to avoid um, where things happen in, on your PCB. Okay. 
Another tip that I wanted to share today was please make sure that you're, you know what's your silk screen to path clearance. I know that in most cases, the board manufacturers will just remove or move the silk screen information to prevent issues. However, what if they don't or what if they forget to do it? You might want to double check and you can also run again your DRCs and it will automatically, some, most of the EDA tools will automatically find where the silk screen is very, very close or overlapping copper pads. And so, as you can see in this image here, <laughs> the silk, you can see the silk screen is pretty much covering all the copper ends, meaning that, you know, it inhibits the solder from flowing and you can have just a bad joint there. I have read that sometimes when people have this issue, they just try to manually remove the silk screen, but that's too dangerous because you can damage, you can end up, you know, damaging your land patterns and your connections, and you will have to do a whole new PCB. And one more thing that I wanted to share is that the new version of IPC, IPC 7351C, is going to introduce guidelines for, I think it's three tire cell screen lines, lines with and also clearances. So let's wait for that standard to be introduced and start changing, changing things, updating things. Uh, at Snap EDA, one, one, one small thing that I wanted to share is that at Snap EDA, the, the clearance that we follow in all our designs, the clearance between the seal screen and the exposed ex copper is at least 0 0.25 millimeters. And talking about Sierra circuits, Sierra circuit tolerances are about five mils, so 0 0.127 millimeters for, again, seal screen to copper. This is the minimum tolerances that they have. So just make sure that, you know, you don't have your shell screen touching or overlapping your pads. And now this is one issue that it is very interesting because it has, it has happened to some of our users. And so the real issue is, are you, 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 need, to, you need to ask yourself, Am I sending the right layer information to, my, to the fabrication house? Am I understanding the function of every single layer in my PCB design? So in this example, you can see that this user looks like they forgot to add the milling slotted holes here, right? So there are no sorted holes. The component will not be connected properly. And then I also want to assure that it is very, very, very important that you define if your EDA tool doesn't support the native slot, slot, sorted holes, just like Eagle, then you need to understand how your EDA tool is going to interact with slurred holes, right? So Altium natively supports them, KiCad as well, the latest version of KiCad does. And, and so you need to start thinking, if I'm using Eagle, I'm gonna need to find a workaround, right? I need to find a workaround and I need to make sure that I'd include a note to my manufacturer with my Gerber's file, letting them know 
A, this outline needs to be milled from, needs to be milled from my PCB. And the reason why we have had these issues is because some of our users are using Eagle and sometimes they don't know how to handle slotted holes or sometimes they just forget to send the Gerber information to their manufacturers. And if you're designing a multiple a multiple PCB layer, so you have in, in inner layers, you have to be very careful about this, at least in equal. Um, you need to, you, I think you need to isolate the connections here. So, okay. We have some more questions here. How do you design, so we have one question, how do you design proper solder mask opening clearance? Okay. Let me, I think, yeah, let me, let me, let me um, share the next tips, but, but basically um, it really depends on on the on on your manufact on your manufacturing house like there sometimes they have limitations for this so you either need to ask them if they have a solder mask opening clearance like a minimum value that you need to take into account and that you need to add in your design rules and yeah, I think that's that's the main that's the main thing that you need to consider there. Okay. Let's go there in the next one. So the next tip that is also very important and it is more related to how am I going to design the lamp pattern if I have, you know, based on the mounting technology that my component has. So it worked, if you want to design land patterns for SMDs, I, I recommend you just follow, stick to IPC 7351B. It has the standard mathematical formulas for calculating calculating for a standard components families. So we're talking about QFMs, QFPs, SOP, SOICs. It helps you to design the coil access, again, based on the density level, the lamp pattern sizes, the line widths, and even the solder paste, as I mentioned before. And then if you're going to design plated true holes components, I will recommend you to follow IPC 2221 to find the right pad diameter. And I can recommend you IPC 2222 to find the minimum hole size for your true for your plated true hole components. And then we also have another, another very interesting issue, uh, but in this case, I'm just gonna share it as, as a tip because it's something that we found on, on a data sheet. And so as you can see here, this is a data sheet that has two different mappings. In the pinout table, you can see that the pad Four, number four is connected to um, TRD2 minus, right? So this is the connection, right? And then when you take a look at the drawing, that is just like one, um, one page below, 
you can see that they're saying, oh, the pad number four is actually connected to the TRD2 positive, right? So, <laughs> so you ended up saying like, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna connect this connector? I don't know how to do the pin mapping here. And you can, if you don't reach out, in this case, the best recommendation is just reach out to the component manufacturer because you don't, you know, you don't want to create shorts by just having, just having these information problems in the data sheets. Okay. I also wanted, wanted to share this one because this one happened to us recently. And what happened was this was a, a module that we were creating. And so my team created this component in May, 2019. When we created these components, we set up the whole pin mapping, we set up all the pin namings and everything. We uploaded the component and then one of our users this year, one of our users told us, well, it looks like, you know, you guys need to update the pin assignments. And so what we realized is that there was a new version of the same component that was released on October, 2019. And that release included new pin assignments. And so that was actually something that, you know, we had to fix really quick because that part was pu published. And so this is just something to consider, you know, always try to track your part revision you need to identify and update components if needed, right? If, if you cannot find the first release component out there, you can, if you cannot buy it, then you're gonna need to update your design following the latest um, data sheet available, the, the latest revision of the components. So just something to keep in mind. Another thing is that another tip is that it's really important to define the origin of your footprints. If you are doing, you know, the whole peak and place um, sewing process. So I know that some of the EDA tools will automatically add an origin marker in your in your land patterns but you know if they don't you really need to add them yourself and make sure that they are correctly placed because you know, most you know, pick and paces machine will pick up the components at the center of gravity and so you just want to make it easier for you know the pick and place machine so this is just another recommendation. And then we have a very similar one, but basically this one was defined by IPC and it has a main goal and it's to create like a world generic, um, like world generic land patterns, right? So the main intention to that IPC had here was that you know if you define the proper zero component orientation based on the standard and the level that you are going to follow then you're going to make your you're going to make it so much easier for the you know for automating the pick and place um, assembly. So IPC 7351 indicates that um, in 
in the CAD library. All pin one's location are in the upper left, but this is level, this is level A, as you can see here, indicates that all pin one locations are in the upper left corner for multiple pin components and pin one on left for two pin components. And then what happens was that IEC, they release a new zero component orientation and that was um, named level B. And so what they pretty much said is that do the same thing, but with the pin one being on the lower left corner. So the most important thing here is do not mix the standards or the levels. Try to stick to one standard and one level for one design. If you're going to follow level A, just make sure that all your components have the same zero orientation. However, one thing that is worth mentioning is that if you send your centroid files, the one that, that we were talking about before, some assembly companies, they will just not need any other information besides the centroid of your lab patterns. But that's for some companies, right? Okay, now, now we have uh, mirror land patterns. And this one is also a very common one. And sometimes it's because, you know, the way that you're interpreting the data sheet when you are creating these land patterns, if you don't read all the notes that uh, the recommended, in this case, the recommended footprint layout has, you will end up creating a mirrored land pattern. And so you will not be able to place or connect your component onto the PCB because it's like on the opposite side. When, you know, some of the things that people, and I guess some of you have done is that when, when these are true holes, they just will try to connect the component from the opposite side of of you know your land pattern but that will not work all you know in all cases and what if you don't have a true whole path a, a true whole component so there this is just something that you really need to check so please always make sure that your components were drawn from the front view, from the correct view. And if you want to, you know, if you want to try to see, you want to try to understand if it matches or if it's, if it's correct, you just have, you know, you can just try to find a 3D model that is available and you can try to match the 2D and the 3D model. That's something that we, we do internally. And one thing that is worth mentioning is that most vendors draw this PCB footprint layouts based on the top view. Occasionally, they'll do the opposite. So in this note, I'm showing you here that they said like the contact arrangement seen from the backside. So you can see here, this is the mirrored footprint and right next to it is the correct footprint. Okay, and one, one more thing that I, I thought it was very important to share is that if we have automated processes, that's gonna just make our life so much easier, especially when it's about things that we don't wanna spend a lot of time on, right? Such as libraries. So, the main thing that I wanted to share here is that you can develop or you can try to find out there very CAD 
models verification tools. Meaning that, you know, you need to think in terms of that you have an input, you have an existing CAD model that you need to, that you want to be reviewed. You want to make sure that it's okay based on uh, the standards that you're following, the industry, industry practices, based on the manufacturer information and some a lot of other parameters. And so once those, those parameters are, you know, you evaluate those parameters on the component and you can set up your own, um, your own diagnostic rules where you can see, okay, the seal screen line width is supposed to be 0.1 one to seven millimeters. Does it pass or does it fail? And so that's one individual check. So if it's 0 0.1 to seven, that's a check. And then you can have a lot more checks. You can see if the pin one indicator is being added, you can try to recognize if the centroid of your footprint is correct you can try to see if the paths are placed on the right layer and even you can you can even test if your milling layer is con is being is being present in the cat in the cat model itself so if you have that layer present there so that's that's the main thing that i wanted to share about verification, automated verification in SAPDA has, we have a, a patented verification checker that is available in every single part page in our site. You can see and you can check manufacturability issues for each component. So that's just a tool that could help. And so just to, fin just to finalize, um, I wanted to give a quick intro about SnapDA. So what is the SnapDA? We are the internet's first cat library for PRISB designers. We provide millions of free schematic symbols and footprints to design better products faster. So just to allow engineers to focus on their PCB design, their product, and not being worried about you know, the libraries since they, they, they start with their project. We follow for land patterns, we follow IPC 7351B, and for schematic symbols, we follow IEEE 315 standard. And we also have our own internal standards because when what happens when you know their the components are custom custom they have custom footprints right and we export to nine different EDA tools some of those are so we have Cadence Allegro or CAD Eagle Altium Mentor Paths we have KiCad. PCV123, Pulsonics. And the last thing that I want to mention is that you, know, you can find everything available about components. So you can find um, designs, uh, you can find reference designs, you can find data sheets, you can find specifications about the components, you can find pricing and some other important things. And then we also have a tool in in case that the schematic symbols are not available, we have a tool that you can use for free to build your own schematic symbols if the, if the land patterns are available for that specific part. And, and just uh, the last, for the last slide, I just wanted to talk about what is Sierra Circuit. So, as uh, some of you might know, so we, um, Sierra Circuits is a PCB design, manufacturing, and assembly um, company. They are located in Silicon Valley, and 
they um, have they support different types of PCB solutions, PCB design solutions, and PCB manufacturing solutions. And they have high reliability PCB prototypes for the military and aerospace industries. So that is all that I wanted to present today. And um, yeah, thank you so much for attending. I'm going to take a look at the answer at the questions right now. We have more questions here. So, okay, we have lots of questions. Um, so it says here, does inductor having dot marking on, on it make, can cause a problem? Okay, yes, that was one of the tips that I also wanted to share, but I didn't include in the slides. It was about adding, you know, if you have polarized components such as diodes or like batteries in, or like, yeah, or, or like uh, lead diodes <laughs> again. <laughs> so what you need to do in those cases is that you need to make sure that you're adding a polarity marking. The polarity marking should be in the sill screen, in the sill screen layer. It needs to uh, make it, you know, a, all the way up until the end of the of the PDB design process. And then it's really important to add it because that way they they will know how to place, you know, your your manufacturing house will know how to place the component in the proper way. And so yeah, I hope that that answered your question. And, and about inductors, I saw one induct one some inductors created by Murata. And those inductors, they were as and as MD2 packages, and they had a polarity marking. And so we actually created those components on assembly A, and we added a dot marking as the polarity marking for those inductors created by Murata. So I hope that answers um, your question. So, Uh, there's one question here regarding the adoption of IPC 25A1. I, I will be happy to get back to you about that questions because about that question because I'm not fully aware of what is that standard version about. So I'll just I'll just get back to you around that. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Here. Okay, so here we have another question. Sometimes in Snap EDA shows three different options for the same device, but sometimes in one of those three devices appears the logo from the manufacturers. That means that is an official device from manufacturer. Oh, you mean, yes. So you're talking about the other or the uploader information in the power pages. Yes. What happened in those situation is that, so there are three different ways and we have, we have different, different like messages, different notifications. If we were working together with a, man, a component manufacturer company such as Murata or T Connectivity or Samtech, we add their logo as they review the components. So we created them for them and they review them and approve them. So we uploaded them to our site, but after being verified by them. And there are other situations where the component manufacturers, they just upload 
their own, we allow them to upload their own files as well. And so for in those cases, what you will see in the other ID information or the uploader ID information, you will see this part was created by Soundtech, for example. This part was created by TE Connectivity. So you can see if you hover over with your, with your mouse over the uploader where you see the logo, you can see the difference there. So I hope that that answers uh, your question. <laughs> We have another question. Does Snap AI prefer to use footprints using millimeters or mils units? So that is a good question. We usually design lamp patterns following uh, millimeter units, but that's just because you know, most of the data sheets that we find and that we're getting they have the units um, in millimeters, but there are some cases where they're in inches or where they're in mils. So what we do is that we follow what we see in the data sheet just to be more cautious. Um, because sometimes when you try to convert it, you convert, you convert from millimeters to mils, you can add, you know, you can add um, a, like, like about like if you can have like about like values problem like a value problem right you can end up having a different a different value for the distance and that just can that just can happen so we usually just follow what the data sheet states um, okay um there's another question here. Can you comment on the heat, on the heat sink capac capability? I don't fully understand that question, sink capability of, of your SS. Uh, I mean, is it about the, the seal screen? Yeah, I don't understand that question. So I will, I will reach out to you later. And so I can try to understand. I can try to understand it. Thank you for asking. And then, are there any land pattern design considerations that you must take into account regarding EMI and EMC? Um, Yes, so for I know that one for just for the what one of the tips that I shared before, which was regarding the connections that you are making in your schematic during the schematic phase. And is that what can happen if you, you can introduce errors? You can introduce um electrical connection errors by having the wrong pin direct directions in your symbols and doing the wrong connections, like maybe not understanding the whole functionality of your symbol that can, and that can lead to having a wrong connection. And maybe, you know, maybe affecting EMI. Okay. It looks like we're also getting questions through the chat. So let's see. Could you please give a little bit of information about press feed components? What type of, of, of information um, would you would you like to know? Like is it about like how we design press feed connectors? Or I guess, yeah, I guess I can, I can try to reach out and 
ask you what exactly you want to know about it. We can share with you some of the designs, uh, land pattern designs that we have made for press feed, press feed connect, connectors components. Okay. Oh, okay. Hold diameter, hold diameters in press feed connectors. Okay. Yes. So I shared before in the presentation that there are two IPC standards that I recommend to use to calculate your hole diameters and drill holes and some you know some of those parameters for your for your holes. That's IPC two 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 one. 2221 two, and 2222. Two, two, two. The main thing is that you need to find their different versions. So you will need to find the one that is regarding um, that specific application that you are looking for. But again, I can I can try to I can try to find one of the press fit fit comp connector components that we have created and I can share that with you and how we calculate it the whole diameters for those components. Another question is, could all of your components be imported in KiCad and be used for free? So all of them at the same time, no. <laughs> and they are, they can be used for free, yes. Our license, um, I, we can share more information about our license, maybe Anna or Alberto can send it to you through our chat. You can, read, you can read more about our license, but our models are free. You cannot import them all at the same time in KitKat. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I hope that answers your, your question. So we have another question from Abraham Rodriguez. He's saying, could you please elaborate M more about the zero component and uh, zero component orientation. Yes, so um, that was one of the tips that I share here. And what 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 basically you know it just basically indicates the rotation that the lamp pattern was built was uh, built to, right? So it's just very, very, very important um, for automating pick and place assembly lines. But again, as I mentioned before, that depends on the IPC standard that you're gonna follow and the level that they're also gonna follow. So if you're gonna follow level A or if you're gonna follow level B and just the main, um, the main suggestion that I can give you, which is the same one as before, do not mix the standards or do not mix the levels, choose one. And even better, you can contact, you can just contact your, um, your fabrication house. You can ask them if, if, you know, if they have um, a peak and place assembly line and if, if so, what, what would you recommend you do? And if they have any, you know, if they have any um, limitations that they want to share with you, and you can even ask them if, a, hey, if I send you just the centroid, my cent the centroid file of my land patterns, will that be enough? Or do you also need all my components to be defined as per, you know, a level, um, an IPC level of zero component orientation. Okay, um, we also have IPC 2581 is the open source follow up to the ODB plus plus standard. Okay, I guess, I guess that's not a question. <laughs> But I'll look more into it. I'm not really that familiar with IPC 251A. So I'm going to take a look at it for sure. Okay. 
Okay, so we have here, I have seen instances where large value MLCC chip packages have cracking issues due to heat in the SMT oven. Do EDAs take this into account to suggest different orientations? So from, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not fully aware of if the EDA's tool take, you know, take that into account. I'm not fully sure, so I'll get, I'll, I'm gonna investigate and I'll get back to you once I have an answer. So we have three more open questions. There's one here saying, just a note to explain why they might have polarity markers. As in the inductors with polarity points to the outer layer of the winding and works as um, shielding if you put to ground. Okay. Yes, that's, that's a really good explanation. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And then we have we have one more question. I have a question related to circular paths for smaller um, packages like zero to zero one size for some manufacturers. Is it okay for some? I'm I'm not sure I understand the question. So I guess yeah, I guess I'm going to reach out to you and try to understand the question. I guess are you asking if if the size if I don't know, I have a question related to circular pad for smaller. Is circular pad okay? Do you mean, are you talking about circular? Okay, are you talking about something bad? Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by circular pad for zero to zero one. Um, I guess adding, do you mean like adding a via or are you talking about the type or can you maybe mention the type of of pad isn't okay. SMD pad, okay, good. SMD pad given a circle in place of rectangular sizes. Oh, okay, got it. I understand now. Um, so for a smaller packages, I highly recommend you to, you know, if if the pitch is really really small, the the package is really small, do not add or carefully if you want to add solder mask openings do it in a very careful way if it's not necessary if it's not necessary to add them do not add it or you know try to see what will be the best way because that really depends on the the, the parts the package is too small and it will it will be you know it will be very hard to it will be very hard for, for you to design it if you don't really under, if you don't really know, for example, if you're gonna have traces very close to those paths or if, you, if you're gonna add another component very close to that. So for those packages that are super small, I just recommend you to just take a look at your clearances, try to set them all up and try to understand your, your manufacturing limitations and try to see if you are meeting all the requirements. Okay, so we have another question. What is the difference between NSMD and SMD in lamp patterns? So it's, um, it's non, um, I think it's like non-solder, not solder mass defined. 
and solder must be fine. So the difference is that basically, it's kind of similar to what I was sharing in the last question, but the difference is that basically you have a custom defined solder mask opening for your pad or you just don't have a defined you just don't have so that's that's just the difference between those two um those two words Uh, Juan Camilo said, thank you for everything. I'll be leaving now. Thanks to you for, for joining. Okay, so Tom is asking, as a recap, what will be the most common issue you see with people's footprints or what would be something easy to look at for? That is a really good question. So the most common issues that we see in other people's footprints is mainly mainly pad sizes so for example they don't know what to follow what standard to follow they don't know if they should just follow the manufacturer recommended the manufacturer recommended um, PCB footprint layout, or if they want to follow IPC standard, but they don't know how to do it. So that's like the top one issue that I would I would say I would say that I, I've been seeing. Um, people just they don't understand what they want to follow, and so sometimes some of our users request us to create a part, and then we make it based on all the decisions that we. All the decisions that we make to see if a component is IPC, um, and it has an IPC standard package or not, we made the decision, we design it, and sometimes our customers get back to us and they ask us, oh, why didn't you follow the recommended, um, the recommended footprint layout? Or why are you following IPC and so the paths are bigger? And so things like that, that you know that sometimes people um it's 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 not that easy to understand but it's something that you can start learning the more you understand about packages the more you start seeing lots of data sheets lots of land patterns the easier you can understand how what is the best decision that you're going to take to design um a a land pattern so I hope that answers uh, your question. Thanks, okay, you're welcome. Um, okay, so we have another one here. Can you highlight on pad versus hole size rate, rate ratio for through hole pins? Is there any Thumb roll, yes. Yes, and again, I would, I can send you the formulas, but I would recommend you to just um, try to investigate looking at the IPC 2221 or IPC 2222 for those type of concerns. If you don't know how you're gonna design your drill holes, that is the best place to go um, because you know those formulas are based based on lots of testing and based on lots of um, people that are very very experienced in in this area and so uh, we at Snapdia that's also what we follow and and so it has been working really well for us. So again, I can send you the, the formulas if needed. <laughs> okay. So we have, uh, Alessandro has another question. 
regarding the 40% reduction of face mask on four by four millimeter pads, should the copper mask be reduced on large pads as well as the face mask? No. Um, no. The, should the copper mask be reduced on large on um, wait let me um let me read the question again sorry regarding 40 percent should the copper mask be reduced on large pads so the only one and so the important thing in for that rule is that this only applies based on the recommendation that ipc does this only applies for exposed pad packages so if you have it exposes, let's say you have a deep pack and then you want to design you want to design um this over mask wait are you but i think i think you're talking you're mixing oh, okay sorry no never mind yeah so again just to just to recap if you have a, an exopad that is bigger than four than four um, by four millimeters, just please um, try to segment. You know, you, you just need to try to segment it, segment your um, your solder paste. Um, as I as I mentioned again. Um, having you know like a symmetrical pad array and you can just basically um, try to make it so you just try to place the it really depends on the size of the exposed pad and how many um, how many symmetrical square is there based on the reduction that you're gonna make as well if you're going to be a 40% reduction or if you're going to make a 50% and 80% reduction. And so that really depends on that. But again, just, just to be extra careful, I recommend you to take a look at the IPC standard that I recommended before, which is uh, 75525. So just try to take a look at that one. And um, if you don't fully understand some of the parameters or the, the functions and the, the rules that we have there to define these segmented stencils, you can just come, come back to me or to someone at SAPDA and we can try to help you to understand. Okay, um, I think those are all the questions that we had. <laughs> So I just want to thank again everyone. And if you have any questions or if there is something that you would like to share with me, feel free to reach out at uh, my email, elizabeth at snappyda.com. And so it was, it was great sharing this webinar with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. It was a great presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.